Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today, we're giving a talk on a paradigm shift, leveraging private cloud to encourage scale and resiliency at the app layer. Uh, I'm Andrew Mitri at Walmart. Uh, this is a... Uh, I'm Sridhar Basim. I'm also from Walmart. And Rick Malik, also from Walmart. Thank you all for being here. Cool. So uh, we're going to kind of dive right in, and then we're going to leave about 10 to 15 minutes uh, at the end for questions, and we can go deep after that, and we'll be available afterwards as well. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, designed to be a little bit more intro level in terms of how we've, uh, in the past at Walmart, and also uh, Shri and I come from Comcast uh, previously, I've built out uh, applications to, to scale on top of cloud. So we're going to talk about a few of those use cases today. Uh, with permission from Comcast and as well Walmart. Um, and so we wanted to kind of start off with a few definitions, some basics, just for those who are new, about some of the paradigms that we uh, encourage our, the applications as they onboard onto cloud. Um, and uh, one of the first things is uh, the, the, the idea of horizontal scale out. Um, you know, we want as load increases that you add additional units and have them act in concert. We want to be able to split those workloads across those units we want to offer a promise of linear, infinite scale. And we want to start, so this is one of the things that was interesting that we did uh, quite a bit at Comcast, is we, instead of going to an application, uh, let's say like our residential email team and saying, let's move over the entire residential email platform. Why don't you start with moving over your app, maybe your web, uh, uh, maybe some caching tiers, things that are um, work well in the cloud paradigms. Uh, and that gets those teams, uh, those uh, DevOps teams or, or whatever types of teams familiar with how to use cloud and how to get, understand that paradigm so that as they undergo transformation in their own application, they guide and lead those things in the right direction for the, the current parts of those apps that aren't cloud friendly or cloud native today. And that actually worked really well as a model in onboarding new applications is not take on the whole world at once and, you know, we got to fix five million things and redesign all these things. Let's start with what works move that piece over, and then kind of, you know, chip away uh, at the application. And one of the other things that we found early on at Comcast is um, that uh, having, you know, a scalable commodity block and object store was uh, key to our effort, and I think we do have a Ceph talk on uh, Thursday kind of going into some of that as well. Um, uh, another key tenet or in, in the paradigm, uh, you want to go over elasticity? So one of the things that we require our tenants is to be able to grow and scale their environments as the load grows. So um, this required that the resiliency be shifted to the app versus the infrastructure being able to uh, provide that same sort of resiliency. Um, some apps were uh, by inherently uh, better suited for this, and other apps uh, had to be worked on to get it up there. Um, the elasticity also meant that uh, the app layer had to be uh, able to scale as demand for uh, the service grew. And they had to do it dynamically so that you're not wasting infrastructure uh, holding onto like a big footprint and then uh, using it only once in a while. Um, Andrew already covered the promise of linear in a scale. Um, the, the other thing we drove our app teams to think about is uh, failure of the infrastructure itself and to move some of that resiliency uh, into the app tier. So if, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're in the cloud, then you needed to be able to support um, running your service even when an entire region or an OpenStack data center went down. Um, and this kind of drove the principle of like plan for failure. So teams were constantly required to think about like how they would re react when the infrastructure wasn't that resilient in the first place. Yeah, and I mean, some of the things that we did in that space is we did do war gaming where we would simulate data center and network failures. Um, and we also, um, uh, we, we had a different support model for cloud applications. So like for example, we actually, uh, losing a hypervisor node was not a pageable event in our cloud operations, right? Um, and we, we, as an SLA, we, we gave that up to our application owners saying you should be able to survive losing a hypervisor or two. And actually, in our example, uh, this did happen uh, during peak. Uh, and the application, uh, actually, they came back and, and noted it as a fault that they didn't even realize that they'd lost it, right? The application self-healed and scaled out more VMs and was able to continue operating. Uh, so maybe we'll dive into the case study a little bit. So um, 
uh, at Comcast, um, well, we had a group called X1 Apps, um, and uh, they were chartered at the beginning of uh, 2014 um, uh, to build out an app that would stream all the various uh, video feeds for the Winter Olympics. Um, and uh, and this, uh, the Winter Olympics were in February of 2014. They, they got this charter at the beginning of January. So they had uh, basically a month to not only build the app, but scale the infrastructure. Um, uh, you know, and so they were able to uh, go ahead and deploy an app in a month. Uh, they were able to scale up based literally on the demand from the users for the Olympics and then kill that infrastructure o over, um, over a period of time. Uh, part of the way they did this is they built kind of an internal PaaS tool leveraging jQuads to, to orchestrate OpenStack and was then extended to bring elasticity to VMware too. That's how some of the stuff that they had done at Comcast. Um, but I think one of the most important things, um, and uh, I, in a previous keynote from Disney, um, the guy there said, you know, uh, nowadays everything has to be fast, fast, fast. Time means money. And being able to make that infrastructure available to our application so that they can deploy uh, elastically was just key. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, they had deployed, you know, uh, across all these VMs uh, and uh, had set up, uh, they were using actually, um, uh, various load balancing techniques so that they could lose any one of those VMs and then it would, uh, Zookeeper would detect that they had lost that VM and spin up a new VM somewhere else. So this team already was deploying into AWS and they loved uh, getting API access to OpenStack and kind of like took to it immediately. Most of their app workloads were uh, the front end web tier and some caching tier. Um, they built jclouds based uh, orchestration tool to work with uh, our OpenStack APIs and also AWS and VMware. And with that, we'll hand it off to Rick Perfect. to talk about uh, the next Let's case uh, study. Sure. Oh. Good morning, everybody. Um, how do you like our vests? <laughs> <laughs> Who's here from the United States? So you know the vest. Uh, but those who aren't here from the United States, we wanted to sort of give the complete Walmart experience. We actually had to work pretty hard to get a, get a hold of these vests. So if you work in Walmart and IT, you don't have to wear the vest. So this is just for fun. So maybe we should give a little context on what Walmart yeah. is for those who aren't. Yeah, yeah, I've got a slide for that. I'll talk at the end a little bit about the company. Um, uh, but for right now, I wanted to talk about um, moving applications that uh, are not cloud native onto a virtualized environment or onto a cloud. So how many of us have moved applications that are your, you know, legacy traditional M tier applications onto uh, OpenStack or, or just a couple? Three, four, five? Okay, good. Because um, I, I was worried that um, would I be too, too technical or too general or, or what have you. So it sounds like we're, we're all pretty new to this and I wanted to share with you our experience uh, moving a couple of uh, multi-billion dollar sites that are, that are not cloud native into OpenStack and sort of what we learned by that and, and why we did that. Um, so Walmart.com in the US is, is nearly 100% cloud native and the way that happened was um, as we were working on building out our cloud capabilities, you know, the, the, uh, the, the compute nodes, the management nodes, um, the, all of the OpenStack infrastructure, all, all of that, the data centers. Um, the development teams in parallel were working on rewriting the site from top to bottom to be, um, you know, a service-oriented architecture approach to uh, the way they develop the websites, uh, which is different than the way they developed in the past. So this was a new experience for them. It took a lot of time. It took a couple of years for them to do the rewrite. Um, we did, like a lot of other companies, I think we tried several things with cloud first. We tried our, our own APIs. We were gonna have the Walmart API. Uh, tried to do it ourselves. Looked at uh, a couple of vendor products. Uh, one from Microsoft, I believe, and, and, and from another vendor as well. Finally, at that time, OpenStack was really starting to gain some traction around the Grizzly timeframe, uh, Havana Grizzly timeframe. Uh, so um, we acquired a, acquired a company that I'll talk about later called OneOps that had a tight integration into OpenStack. So that's how we landed on OpenStack. So that's what we were doing 
while the application teams were rewriting their applications uh, to be service-oriented architectures. Um, but what's true for .com in the US is not true across uh, Walmart Enterprise. Uh, it's a 50-year-old company. Uh, there's a lot of best-in-class solutions from their day deployed into the data centers. And uh, uh, we have it on our roadmap going forward to, to try to turn the ship and, and get more, uh, you know, work with the application teams to get more apps rewritten uh, to be cloud native. Uh, and try to see how we can go faster. Um, so we were really pleased to, to have the folks from the Comcast team come over and help us to do that, and um, I think we're, we're well positioned for next year. So transformation is really, in my view, sort of an iterative process. It's not a black and white, and I think Andrew alluded that too with uh, your, some of your experiences at, at Comcast. You start with what you can and then uh, move forward from there. Uh, so as, as in nature, I said, migration is a journey. And, um, and I think we'll, we'll all experience that. So I want to talk about a business, uh, a hypothetical business, but it's based on a, 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 real, a real incident, a real business. Uh, if you're late 40s like me and you grew up in the United States, you grew up watching the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Hour on Saturday morning. And, uh, as Wiley Coyote was trying to get the Roadrunner, he would order various products from Acme Company, Acme. So in the US, uh, Acme has come to mean just a generic term for a company. And uh, so I, I wanted to give you that context. Uh, Acme is a, a, a pretend company we're going to talk about, but its story is based on, on real life. So they had um, a five-year-old ATG uh, e-commerce platform. Uh, for its members, uh, it was running on uh, bare metal hardware, Solaris Spark. Um, what they wanted to do then was to migrate 35 applications that made up this website. Uh, they were, again, end tier monolithic enterprise applications to uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux on x86. Um, put it on a private cloud and start to become cloud native. Um, they had some business goals. Um, they're the typical business goals of smaller, faster, cheaper, better. Um, but 25% increase in operational efficiency. So in other words, they wanted to provision in minutes or hours versus weeks or months. Um, they wanted a 50% increase in site performance. So that can include things like page response times as well as checkout. Uh, and uh, a 75% decrease in hardware costs and data center costs. So their footprint of Solaris Spark was quite large in the old data centers, and um, you know, uh, moving to cloud uh, opened up other opportunities for um, either using that space for something else or those servers for something else. There were a couple constraints that the architects had uh, starting out. One, uh, we have an approach uh, for our private cloud. Uh, for, for the company's private cloud that VMs are ephemeral and, you know, uh, short-lived and uh, can be easily thrown away and, and replaced without uh, any degradation or harm to the business. Uh, block storage was also something that was not available to, uh, to Acme. They didn't have the funds or choose at this time to invest in it. So uh, those were two constraints on the architects starting out. So their approach was to fully leverage OpenStack, along with a tool called OneOps, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, to transition and stra uh, start transforming to cloud native. Um, so they created a new VLAN in each data center for the Acme e-commerce site. Uh, they put every application behind a VIP as if it were a service. Uh, there was no host-to-host -host communication at all. Um, they, uh, they had a policy in the company that every application had to be deployed into two clusters, or we call them regions, two cloud regions and two data centers. So um, uh, I, I did a little bit of math and worked out that, you know, eight VMs would be the smallest application footprint if they had two VMs in two cloud clusters or regions and two data centers, so two, four, six, eight. Um, 
we've, we've found that it's a, 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 as a best practice, it's slightly better to over-provision <coughs> non-native applications in your private cloud to, try to, to be, try to begin to force the problem of infrastructure stability up higher into the, uh, into the application stack. So they ran into a couple of challenges, of course. Um, apps that required, remember these are old legacy apps, apps that required uh, only a single instance, um, those were eliminated right off the bat. They didn't even try to put those onto OpenStack. And, and there were two out of the 30, two out of the 30, 35 applications that uh, required a single instance. What the team found was, though, that if they de had decided to invest in block storage, one of those apps could have migrated, maybe doing something like running it in an active-passive type of configuration, um, and then maybe leveraging dedicated hypervisors uh, using host aggregates in OpenStack. They didn't explore that, but that, that was just, that was an option that they realized sort of after the fact, in hindsight. Uh, their eStore application used sticky sessions on the local VMs, and by that, um, the, the impact of that is that if, if a VM dies when a customer is browsing or checking out, um, they're obviously going to lose their session, and they're going to have to uh, re-log in again. Um, <coughs> the business accepted that risk for the short term, but that's obviously... Uh, pointing to another best practice that we can think about, and that is the developers must move session management outside of local VMs because they're ephemeral. Um, you know, uh, some sort of key value store or other solution outside of the uh, ephemeral VM. So if the way I look at it, I, I spoke about it as being an incremental journey, uh, crawl before you walk, that kind of thing. Um, so what did they accomplish? So we got to celebrate some wins by, by getting these sites onto, onto the cloud. So they migrated from Solaris to Linux, they migrated from physical to virtual. Um, by leveraging OpenStack, they have a self-service uh, agile infrastructure. By leveraging OneOps, they have a cloud platform with application and service abstraction. Um, the team is, the, the development team is making fewer assumptions about their deployment environments, right? Which is which is what we want them to do. We don't want them to always count on server with IP address, blah blah blah, always going to be available to them and for them. So we need them to start thinking differently. Uh, the team started thinking, obviously, more in terms of elastic and ephemeral uh, VMs. Um, historically, last year during holiday, Acme's e-commerce site was. Uh, not scalable at all. They went into holiday locked and loaded with, with, with their best estimates and what they thought they would need and, and, and how they would perform. Uh, but now being on the cloud, they do have horizontal scalability as well as they're seeing a 4X improvement in site stability versus being on the old Solaris Spark physical infrastructure. Um, so the, they know that they gotta work now to start de decomposing their site into services which can be deployed and scaled independently. Um, so one way to do that is to, um, uh, you know, maybe sort of freeze the code base as it exists today and start building microservices sort of around the edges of this mo monolith, if you will. Um, they, um, they're thinking about design patterns to decouple the new from the old. Uh, creating uh, API contracts that make the, the legacy stuff look like microservices to, to that which, which they're writing. Um, and, um, you know, over, over some time, I think what, what they'll see is that uh, they've totally surrounded this, this legacy monolithic code base um, with something that can be, you know, retired at some point. Uh, so, you know, the process of rewriting just can't happen overnight. The, continues, the business still has to continue moving forward and, and meeting business goals and objectives. But this is one way that some have approached to, um, to do it, and I think we're um, Acme companies on course to, to do a similar thing. Um, there are a lot of cultural things that also have to happen. I've spoken about a couple of them, but um, another one is we need teams to align to a DevOps culture. Um, 
cross-functional teams that owned the product from development all the way through operations. This, this is how the company is trying to align um, their development teams. And I think all of these things together, the, the ACME is now on a course that, that, that they're beginning to address these. And, you know, these, these things plus some others are going to get them to, to cloud native. But this is, a, you got to start off small and, and continue to iterate. Now I'll talk uh, a little bit about OneOps. Has anybody heard of OneOps? Not very many. Um, so OneOps is um, is a um, is part of our platform as a service offering at Walmart. Uh, it sits on top of OpenStack. Um, currently today we have 3,000 developers at Walmart leveraging OneOps. Um, deploying 30,000 new or updated services per month and around 3,500 3, applications are hosted within OneOps. So um, that's it's pretty impressive. What the company would like to do now that it's sort of reached this point of maturity is to release this to the open source community because we've seen success in, in the Walmart enterprise and we feel that uh, there's an opportunity for success in, in other, prize, other enterprises as well. Having this out in open source will, will be not only the right thing to do, but it'll be a good, good thing to do for the community. So what, is, what does OneOps do? So it delivers cl continuous cloud-based application life cycles and empowers the enterprise to take on new projects and drive growth. So it's collaborative and visual. It's model-driven. It's a library of best practices. It's cloud platform abstraction. It's self-service agile infrastructure. Um, it's a platform for rapid, repeatable, consistent provisioning of application environments and, and backing services uh, as well. Um, so it really enables a continuous life cycle of management of complex business critical application workloads on any cloud-based infrastructure. But, uh, you know, of course we're uh, concerned about OpenStack uh, here. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's, it's logically placed, at Walmart it's logically placed in the PaaS layer in the same way that OpenStack is logically placed in our IS layer. Um, and uh, OneOps, because of that, OneOps, OneOps abstracts both our platform as a service offerings and our infrastructure as a service offerings uh, for our developers, therefore OneOps's platform. So in terms of lifecycle, you define application workloads based on architectural and application requirements. You provision environments by mapping the design output against operational requirements. You then monitor and control those environments to maintain the required operational levels. So uh, OneOps will help the application to horizontally scale, contract, replace VMs that die for, for some reason and, and need to be replaced. So it's really sort of um, that kind of tool and more in that it also helps the business to begin working in a consistent way. Um, in other words, you don't have developers uh, going to the Horizon dashboard doing things one way. You don't have developers with, um, you know, uh, direct access to hypervisors or VMs and going and deploying their own environments, right? And then pushing code manually or something like that. You're trying to get the whole company to follow a consistent process and that's, that's where OneOps can help. Uh, workloads. So OneOps provides design catalogs for applications. So you can, create and you can create designs, custom designs, and then save them in a private catalog. You can share them across your enterprise to have architectural consistency. And then uh, going forward, you can share them with the open source community. OneOps provides operational best practices for many platforms, inc including relational databases, NoSQL databases, messaging systems, and, and others. You can create your own custom packs uh, for operational best practices. Uh, again, share them across your enterprise or share them with the open source community. And OneOps provides a library of components. These components, they encapsulate lifecycle management for many infrastructure resources, not only servers and storage, but also software artifacts uh, such as OS packages, repositories, and many others. 
Um, you can create and package custom components. Uh, you can integrate with many cloud services, and you can share custom components with the open source community. So that's really the promise here, and that's where we're, we're hoping to see this, this tool sort of grow and find its place uh, in the community. Portability, out of the box, it's going to support uh, three cloud platforms, obviously OpenStack um, and OpenStack cloud providers, uh, Azure, AWS, and then, you know, we'll see how it's extended. Uh, I don't recognize this slide. <laughs> so, holiday 2015. So by the end of the year, they want to have this out into the, into the hands of the open source community. You can go to oneops.com, uh, keep an eye on the blog posting there if you're interested in, in learning more about it and checking it out when it's available. Um, so a little bit about Walmart. Walmart, there's many divisions around the world, many subsidiaries. Uh, Seiyu Group here in Japan is, is Walmart uh, in Japan. Um, vital statistics, uh, huge retail footprint, 11,500 stores worldwide, selling a wide range of merchandise, um, but focused most recently on uh, grocery home shopping. Uh, revenues of 486 billion and 2.2 uh, million employees. Now I say all that to say this, and my, this last slide will be my final slide. Um, there's room for 2,200,001 associate, namely, we're hiring and we're looking for people just like you. And uh, who here has, a, has an easy time hiring and finding OpenStack resources? <laughs> <laughs> So then you know why I'm putting up this slide. I have to take advantage of this time. So huge company, challenging problems, exciting problems to solve for next year. Uh, if you're interested, talk to any one of us. We'll, we'll uh, go onto our careers portal and, and search for cloud or search for OpenStack. You'll find jobs that way, or you can reach out to any of us and, and we'll help you through the process. But uh, we're always looking for talent just like at what this is at this conference. So. Uh, we're going to be the first to deliver a seamless shopping experience at scale for 260 million customers around the world. So they're going to, the, we are going to integrate the, the physical stores with the e-commerce presences with mobile and give the customer a, a, um, a seamless shopping experience that saves her time as well as um, taking advantage of Walmart's everyday low prices. Uh, and private, cl private cloud, honestly, is integral to, to all of that. And, and for that reason, we're looking for people just like you. So with that being said, um, here's some contact information. We do have the presentation posted under, right now, under the, um, the event, you know, the event. What do they call it? SCED.org. Yeah. In SCED.org, we, we have posted. Uh, I'm assuming shortly after the presentation, the video will be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, I'll put a link to the presentation there as well uh, to help you. And then feel free to reach out to any of us at any time if you have any questions or uh, would like to explore any other thing, any other topic. So okay. thank you very much for your time this morning. We'll open and up for questions. Open up for questions. Yeah. And we'll be available outside afterwards, too, for yep. questions. So are you guys basically creating a, a cloud platform for virtual developers both public and private using the OpenStack and the Azure uh, no. Um, the concept is, what, what we did was we created ourselves that which we spoke of for our developers, uh, for our private cloud, which is OpenStack based. Um, because this was a company that we acquired, um, they already had uh, hooks into AWS. Um, as we were getting closer to, we knew we wanted to open source this product at some point. Uh, as they were ramping up to get ready for the open sourcing of it, they added the hooks in for Azure. Um, so that's, that's sort of how the, it, it progressed. But really, internally, for our private cloud, it's, um, it's OpenStack. I guess, um, I mean, is this your answer to Shadow IT, right? Is this to keep your developers using your resources? I, I would think that's, that's a good analogy, actually. Yes. Uh, because everybody, I mentioned we've got 3,000 developers leveraging this process for 3,500 applications, uh, 30,000 times a month. 
So I would, I would think that's a good uh, analogy. If that's the culture and that's the, you know, that's the way the, uh, the, the process flow works and flows, it, it further sort of minimizes the, the chance of shadow IT. So I think that's, that's a good point. Another question in the back? Uh, there's a good question, and I don't know that I have a good answer because I don't know that I personally am that close to it. I can uh, talk to it from the Comcast okay. side a little bit. Okay. It, it has been a culture shift on the Comcast side. Um, uh, teams are, I think, adopting wider skill sets in terms of being able to support. Uh, there needs to be a... Um, the, the developers have to have a deeper understanding of, the, of what the stack looks like. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, of course, there's different attitudes towards that culture shift, but I think in the end they find it empowering because uh, there's nothing more frustrating than not being able to deploy what you've developed on a reasonable time frame, right? And, and I think the wins that they've created um, uh, uh, like uh, encourage the developers to be able to take some of that ownership on. Um, I think it also encourages them to code for scale and for failure and things like that so that they're not getting paged in the middle of the night, right? Um, uh, and of course, we, we, we do experiment some with hybrid models where there's still an outside tier one that does some of the basic monitoring before escalating, things like that, so they're not necessarily getting paid for every event. Um, but uh, it is a culture change within the company. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention one more quick thing before I let you guys go. Um, there's this book, and it's only 50 pages. It's called Migrating to Cloud Native Application Architectures. And it's free from uh, Pivotal, if they're here. I don't know if they're here. Matt Stein, I don't know if Matt Stein's here. I didn't ask him if I could plug his book. But I read it a couple of weeks ago, and, and literally every page that he's got on this book, I'm like, either we're doing that or, or we're th talking about doing that. Uh, and it goes really deep. So I would recommend this to uh, anybody um, who's in this session thinking about these things. Migrating to Cloud Native Application Architectures. And the author's name is Matt Stein. containers to we model use, different uh, services? Well, there's another level of abstraction in OneOps. Um, they're called assemblies, application assemblies. So each uh, service uh, becomes an assembly in OneOps that can be deployed independently of, of others. So you have, uh, you have really a, con uh, a continual uh, uh, deployment pipeline happening at that point if you've got uh, uh, that many services, uh, yeah. 3,500. Um, in the system that can be always, you know, 30,000 times a month being being updated or new services added. So, the, so an app has, let's say, 10 assemblies, and each of them is a VM, like the manifestation of runtime manifestation. Mul probably multiple. Each of them is multiple VMs. Multiple but yes. VM. Mm -hmm. So the assembly is uh, the assembly is a combination of resources, not just VM. You can define like this is a, the you know think of it as packs for what software goes on the VM, what uh, load balancer you want to use, uh, which places you want to deploy to. So there's a lot of metadata which is there. The end deployment running itself right now is on VMs. But it, it's not necessarily tied to be VMs. Uh, so OneOps could support different deployment models, possibly containers or bare metal mm -hmm. as well in, in the future as well, mm -hmm. uh, which could be managed by OpenStack, right? So That's right. Uh, yeah. So we, we are actually actively exploring those options today. I actually, I actually hear two things. Uh, you, you kind of use like a microservice approach, uh, in which you abstract uh, the failure to, to the one layer below, and you also do this for applications itself, where self-healing capabilities are built into the application to support that. So yeah, I might have misspoke earlier. I might have said microservices when I meant to say services. Uh, so so what make you? Uh, what made you? What do you think is the true benefit? of having the self-healing capabilities added to the service itself as opposed to having it on a cluster-based technology such as Mesos or something like that? Yeah. Well, that, that interestingly is covered uh, in the book. So 
I, I imagine there's, there's probably lots of different points of view on that. But um, the, the idea that you push as much to the client as possible, which includes things like load balancing, uh, horizontal scaling, that seems to be the part of the definition of cloud native, uh, at least as far as I understood it in the books that I've read. So uh, to me, that means microservices. To me, that means um, uh, containers uh, and, 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 other, and other things. Um, you know, that's just, you know, this is my opinion. I mean, I think one of the things that we get with self-healing, right, in, in the application layer that we were seeing before is the the application developer is the one that has the best understanding of how to heal and manage those sessions or, or their clients or whatnot. And uh, when you, once you start to push that on us further down in the stack, the, the less understanding that the infrastructure can have and deal with that type of failure. So we want to give the intelligence where the, on, on how to deal with resiliency or elasticity or scale uh, as far up the sca stack as possible. Great. Mm. Yes. Mm -hmm. This was at Walmart. Was this a very kind of top-down driven approach to get all those silos working together? Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so based on that experience, I would say that you need the CIO to help push this, this through with, the, with his VPs and things, you know, or her, or her, repeat, or her VPs, because it's a massive cultural shift. And, um, you know, workloads that were in infrastructure are now being, you know, responsibilities are being pushed up into the application layer. And uh, teams are having to think about how to code differently in order to be successful with cloud. Um, and teams are having to take on ownership of um, things that they've not had to take on ownership for in the past uh, by aligning to bus by aligning their services to business capabilities, uh, and then really owning those capabilities from from top to bottom. So th there's a lot of change happening, and um, you know we're not 100% there yet ourselves, but I think we're on a path that that's going to align uh, with um, with um, cloud-native uh, application architectures. All right, any other questions? Cool, well, thank you guys very much. Yeah, thank you. Available it's, after. It's been All fun, right. thank you.